Our next talk uh, will be Daniel Houghton talking about approximations of extremal eigenvalues for sparse Hamiltonians. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be up here. Today I'll be presenting on um, some approximation algorithms for the extremal eigenvalues of uh, sparse fermionic and qubit Hamiltonians. Uh, this is joint work with Ojas Parik and Kevin Thompson, who joined me at Sandia National Labs. Uh, we're all a part of uh, QUAC, which stands for the uh, Quantum Applications Algorithms Collaboratory. So since I work in sort of a pseudo-industry job, I like to start with the bottom line uh, and the results up front. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, an improved graph-based classical algorithm for approximating the extremal energies of some sparse local Hamiltonians. And what I think is nice about this work is that it comes with provable constant factor guarantees. Like I said, this algorithm is also going to work for fermionic and qubit Hamiltonians, which is rare so far in the literature. And we can also show that uh, this is optimal in some sense, and I'll get into that a little bit later in the talk. So first, a little bit of motivation and context at a very high level. Uh, as most of, if not all of us are aware, finding the ground states of physical systems is a central problem of modern physics. It's also central to the field of optimization, and that's because you can reformulate many classical optimization problems into uh, solving into finding the ground state of some Hamiltonian. Of course, this means that this task is, in general, computationally very difficult. And what that means is that, in practice, we can do two things. We can instead focus on approximating the ground state energy, which is also most likely very challenging, which then leads us to having to focus on narrower classes of Hamiltonians, which is exactly what we'll do in this work. So in this work, we're going to address local sparse Hamiltonians. You should think of locality as a condition on the number of qubits or particles that each term in your Hamiltonian uh, interacts with. And you should think of sparsity as a condition on the number of Hamiltonian terms for which a given particle uh, sort of pops up in. All right. So a little bit of background just to lay the scene for sort of the state of, uh, of classical approximation research. It really falls into two clamps. Uh, the, most of the research has been done on systems of qubits, and that's because this is the setting where you find a lot of the natural analogs to classical optimization problems. Uh, the problem that people focus on a lot is quantum max cut, which generalizes max cut, which is a very classic graph problem. Uh, back in 2013, Brandon, Brendau and Haros opened up this field uh, by demonstrating that you could get some good product state approximations to the ground states of certain two local uh, qubit Hamiltonians. A few years later, Harrow uh, returned to the problem with Montanaro and gave some really nice bounds on the extremal eigenvalues of sparse local qubit Hamiltonians. So really, you should think of our work as um, improving upon the Harrow and Montanaro result. And I'll do a little bit of comparing and contrasting later. Of course, you don't just have to work with product states. And there has been some work uh, primarily by Anshu et al. in this 2020 paper, uh, which was actually part of the TQC that year, where they were able to move beyond product states for the quantum max cut problem. And there are some nice results by my collaborator, uh, Ojas Parikh and Kevin Thompson, which prove optimality bounds for product states and quantum max cut. Of course, we don't just have to focus on qubits. We can also consider systems of fermions, like electrons. Uh, there's a, you know, uh, lots of Hamiltonians that we care about in this setting. First and foremost is the Fermi-Hubbard model, for which our results will actually apply to. Um, this field, this area is a little less well studied. Bravia et al. back in 2018 studied for two local fermionic Hamiltonians, so that's your uh, classical Fermi-Hubbard model, and they are able to work with Gaussian states to get, in general, pretty good approximations to these ground states. Um, that left an open question of whether or not you could always find good Gaussian state approximations, and I should say that Gaussian states are, in some sense, a natural analog of product states in the fermionic setting. They're states that have a really nice classical description. Um, of course, they don't always work, which is what uh, this Hastings-O'Donnell paper said, 
But out of that Hastings O'Donnell paper came a talk at QIP this year by Harris Semenko, which focused on sparse for two local Hamiltonians. And what they were able to do is give a graph-based constant factor approximation. And our work again, I bring this up because our work again really takes that work to the next level. It simplifies a lot of their algorithm and it expands the class of Hamiltonians that you can consider. So really think of this work as marrying the harris Semenko work with the Hastings, um, the Harrow and Montanaro work I talked about earlier. So just so we're on the same page, here's a little bit of background on fermionic Hamiltonians. Throughout this talk, we're going to be writing everything in the second quantization. So we'll always be considering n modes of fermions. In this case, you can always write your Hamiltonians down as polynomials in your uh, creation and annihilation operators. It's a little bit easier, though, for us to work with the Majorana operators. So for each fermionic mode, you can associate two Majorana operators, which are just linear combinations of the creation and annihilation operators. And these uh, Majorana operators have some really nice properties. They're Hermitian, they obey the canonical anti-commutation relations, and they're also traceless. These are all going to be important facts for proving how well our algorithm works. So again, a little more notations just so that we're all on the same page. Throughout this talk, we're going to consider Hamiltonians of the following form. We're going to take uh, sums over subsets of the, e of the numbers 1 through 2n. All of those subsets are going to have even size. We're going to take sums over these subsets of h sub gamma. h sub gamma is either a real or purely imaginary number. And then h sub gamma is multiplying c to the gamma, where c to the gamma is a monomial of each of the Majorana terms that's indexed by gamma. And then this script uh, e is just all the terms in your Hamiltonian with non-zero weights. We say again that H is Q local if the size of all of these gammas is less than or equal to Q for all the gamma in math script E. And we say that H is K sparse if for every Majorana operator, so for every CP, we have uh, at most K gammas for which CP is in gamma. So those are just the conditions we're working with. All right. So before I dive into the algorithm, I think it's easiest to explain what's going on in a simple, small example. So we're going to look at the 4-2 case, because this is, in general, the sort of setting that we care the most about from a physically motivated setting. So let's consider this simple toy Hamiltonian, which is a sum of a couple of uh, two local terms with some four local terms. And this is where you see the importance of having uh, H either be real or purely imaginary. In order to get that H is Hermitian, we need the two local terms to have uh, a complex number out in front of them. So step one for our algorithm starts with building the interaction graph of this Hamiltonian. And you build the graph according to some fairly simple rules. So the vertices in your, ha in your interaction graph are just the gammas that you have in your Hamiltonian. And then you connect two vertices if and only if one of the following two conditions occurs. If gamma intersect gamma prime is non is empty, or if there exists a third gamma double prime such that gamma union gamma prime is contained in gamma double prime. Um, these conditions might be a little mysterious at first. The motivation behind the conditions is that we're trying to control which terms appear in the state that we're constructing, and we're trying to control how those terms interact with the terms in our Hamiltonian. We basically want to greedily suck up all the terms in the Hamiltonian that we can get positive energy on while ignoring terms that might reduce the energy of the state that we ultimately construct. So after you build the interaction graph, you're going to partition it into independent sets. This can be done efficiently. Um, yeah, this can be done efficiently. And um, according to, yeah, it can be done efficiently. So these are the independent sets that we get for our Hamiltonian. Um, we have three independent sets, one colored in light green, uh, four independent sets, sorry, and then we have some singleton independent sets. Once you have your graph partitioned into independent sets, you're going to select a maximal independent set. 
Maximal here isn't just the most, uh, the, lar the size of the largest independent set. Maximal actually means um, it sort of carries the most weight in your Hamiltonian, and I'll put down the actual condition uh, in a little bit. But once you find this maximal independent set, you're going to use it to construct your output state. So the state that you construct from your maximal set is defined as follows. It's a normalized sum of the product over all the gammas in your independent set of the identity plus the sign of h sub gamma times c to the gamma. And there's a little bit of abuse in notation here. Uh, when I say sine of h sub gamma, if h sub gamma is purely imaginary, I really mean the sine times the identity, times uh, i. And the nice thing about constructing a state this way is that if we multiply everything out, like in our example, what you'll see is that we get an identity term, and then we get each of the terms in our independent set, and then we get some four local terms that don't appear in our Hamiltonian, as well as higher terms. So when we go to take the trace of rho with h, the only way, because Majorana operators are traceless, the only way that we can pick up energy from our Hamiltonian is exactly by matching up the terms in our independent set to, the, to themselves in the Hamiltonian. So this is picking off nice terms in the Hamiltonian to give us, in some sense, a maximal energy. You should morally think about this as kind of finding like a maximal commuting set. It's not exactly what we're doing, but morally speaking, that's kind of what we're doing. So what's the actual algorithm in full generality? Well, our input is going to be a k-sparse q-local Hamiltonian. And our algorithm works just like it did in the example. We're going to construct an interaction graph according to the exact same rules uh, that we saw in the example. So I connect uh, vertices if their associated gammas intersect non-trivially, or if when those gammas are combined, they appear in some other gamma double prime in your Hamiltonian. You can then partition G into at most degree G plus one independent sets that follows from Brooks' theorem and can be done efficiently. Then you select a maximal independent set, which is defined as the arg max of the sum over the gamma in the set S sub I of the absolute value of the coefficients associated to gamma. And then you just output the state that we saw earlier. We can prove that this gives you a nice constant factor approximation ratio by following the, this series of inequalities. We know that uh, the maximum eigenvalue of h over the degree of g plus 1 is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the absolute value of all the h's in your Hamiltonian divided by the degree, which, um, because of how we're constructing this graph, because of this partitioning into independent sets, has to be less than or equal to the sum of h gamma, the absolute value of h gamma, over some independent set, which is going to be equal to the trace of h rho. So what we really need to prove is that trace of h rho is actually equal to the sum over the independent set. And that's exactly where conditions 1 and 2 in building that interaction graph come from. So condition one ensures that we don't get any cancellation when we expand rho. In other words, when we expand rho out, we're really picking up the terms. The terms that we're picking up in the expansion really are the sort of terms that we want uh, from the interaction graph. And condition two in terms that arbitrary unions of elements in SI don't pop up uh, in the Hamiltonian. And if we're a little careful with signs, this lets us show that the trace of C gamma rho is either the sine of H gamma, if gamma is in the independent set, or it's zero. And this condition is just telling me that if I take the trace of H and rho, I'm actually picking up only the terms in H whose gammas correspond to gammas in SI. And I'm getting positive energy on all of those terms. And that's where our results come from. So, all of our results in this column come from analyzing the degree of the graph, of the interaction graph that we construct. And you can do a little compare and contrast um, to either the Harrisomenko result, um, where you have, well, let me back up a little bit. Something to note is that all of our results are constant factor. There's no dependence on the system size 
for any of our approximation ratios. It only depends on the locality of your Hamiltonian and the sparsity of the Hamiltonian. That's pretty nice. That's not necessarily new, though. Uh, the other state of the art results all had that. But in the qubit case, we're able to get sort of exponential improvement in terms of the locality of your Hamiltonian. And in the fermionic case, we're the first to expand to a generic case sparse Q local case, which was not handled by Harrisomenko at all. Here are some additional nice facts about our work. Uh, I promised you I'd talk a little bit about Gaussian states earlier. So we can show that the state rho that we construct is a probabilistic mixture of Gaussian states. And what that means is that there has to be a Gaussian state out there that obtains energy at least what our rho is obtaining. So this is a non-constructive proof uh, of the existence of a Gaussian state with a constant factor approximation ratio uh, for sparse, case sparse Q-local fermionic Hamiltonians. We can also prove the optimality of our analysis in the strictly Q-local case. And what I mean by optimality is that there's asymptotically no better sort of formula relating the um, maximum eigenvalue of H to, um, to some function of Q and K, the locality and the sparsity. And the example is fairly simple. I won't go into all the details, but it's provided by this family of Hamiltonians. So N here is the number of fermionic modes. And what you can show is that for any N, HN can be rewritten in such a way that it's kind of immediately obvious that HN has eigenvalues plus or minus N. And you can also show that the operator norm of H is equal to this maximum eigenvalue N, uh, which gives you N. And if you run our analysis, our algorithm through here, we're actually going to pick up a, um, a theta of N here. So asymptotically, we're, we're sort of getting as close as you can. Um, this is also a nice result because in the strictly two local case, it gives us a way to relate operator norms to maximum eigenvalues if you don't just care about maximum eigenvalues. So what are the next steps? Well, it would be really nice if we could improve the general case sparse Q local bound. That was the only case that we had where we did not have a, um, where we had, um, where we didn't have a sort of linear in Q and K approximation ratio. It would also be really nice if we could get improved techniques for generic Q-local fermionic Hamiltonians building upon Bravi's result. Our graph-based result really relies on having an interaction graph of bounded degree. It's not really going to port over to a more general case. You can also think about moving beyond Gaussian states, just like Anshu et al. moved beyond product states in the qubit case. And you can also extend this to different algebras. So you can think about doing this work for anions or bosonic systems. Uh, to my knowledge, no one's done work there. In part, uh, what's been challenging for us there is not quite understanding what the appropriate analogs for Majorana operators and Gaussian states are. So if you have any ideas there, I'd love to talk and see if we can hammer anything out. Uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude my talk just a, a little bit early, because uh, I think I might be the last one of the day. Or is there, there's an online talk, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, last physical talk of the day, so I'll conclude it early, and if there are any questions, uh, looking forward to hearing them. Okay then, are, th are there any questions? I assume that means I explained everything perfectly, right? No confusion over the talk. Yeah, yeah there's one in the middle. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask uh, for the, the fermionic case sparse Q local uh, construction. In what sense does the construction actually differ from the Hiroshimanko at all paper? I understand that you obtain better approximation ratios, but I was just wondering what step exactly of the algorithm is different. Yes, so Harrisomenko uh, at all, instead of working directly with independent sets like we did here, which we we're sort of able to unlock because we define our interaction graph a little bit differently than they do, Harrisomenko at all have to work with diffuse sets, which are, you should think about, they're essentially smaller than our independent sets. So they're picking up the 
Morally, their, their technique is very similar. They're trying to pick up positively as many terms in the Hamiltonian as they possibly can, but they do it using a diffuse set, which is strictly smaller than an independent set, because the way that they build their graph, uh, they're concerned a little bit more about uh, bad combinations of terms coming up and sort of picking off things negatively in the Hamiltonian. So that's, that's the crucial difference is they use these diffuse sets, which are, um, you should read the paper if you want to know the definition. It's a challenging definition for me to just give, yeah. I see, and does it make any difference that your construction is non-constructive uh, for, for a pure fermionic Gaussian state or not? Um, so it's non-constructive in the sense, I guess, that we didn't construct it. You can use some standard de-randomization techniques to get the Gaussian, te the Gaussian state, yeah. Okay. So yeah, from a practical perspective or theory, no, it's not really. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's another question at the back. Oh, yeah, so in order to go from fermion to qubits, I, I, I skipped this for time. You have to modify the conditions on building the interaction graph just a little bit. In particular, what you go from is um, right here, where we require gamma intersect gamma prime to be uh, non-trivial. You relax that a little bit. Well, I guess you don't relax it. You strengthen it a little bit so that you don't allow terms in your Hamiltonian that interact on the same qubit. But, but what is your state then? like? Um, the row, because right now you've written it in terms of these Majorana operators. Oh, the Hamiltonian is going to be a sum of uh, polynomials in your, of poly mononomials. Poly I see, poly okay. so these, these C's are just operators in your. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's why we get slightly worse results. Uh, but I think they're all. Yeah, they're all essentially the factor out in front that you get because you have a slightly higher degree in the qubit case. Okay, is there one more question? Okay, so I might ask about the uh, optimality result. Did that apply to all of these entries in this table or was that just one of the examples? Um. So it applies to all the entries in the table in the sense that it is like the strict k sparse strict q local is like the minimum. It sits at the intersection of all of them, right? So if you had a better, um, yeah. Uh, but with that being said, um, we. It doesn't mean that in the like case sparse Q local case, it doesn't preclude you in the case sparse Q local case from getting a better sort of generic approximation ratio. So for case sparse four two local, yeah, and for case sparse um, Q local, yeah. Uh, for that, sorry, for that case, there's hope that you could do better. You could get the the k squared down to a k. Yeah, right. That's, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? 